this is a fantastic crowd thank you all so much for being here what an exciting day and it is my privilege to introduce chad griffin and then to start off the conversation that we're going to have today and i think most of you all know that he is an arkansas native born in hope grew up in arkadelphia and at 19 became the youngest person to work in the West Wing of the White House where he worked for President Clinton for several years. <laughs> Chad has continued to do great things since that time. Of course, we're honored today to be with him as he starts his tenure as president of the Human Rights Campaign but a couple of things he did between the time he left the White House and coming back to us here today, uh, he did some pretty neat things in California. And he was the founding partner of a strategic communications and campaign firm. And I want to tell you just quickly about a couple of things that they took on. Uh, big interests like, special interests like big tobacco, big oil, and the far right. And some of the propositions that he led the fight against our Proposition 87, which was California's Clean Alternative Energy Initiative. I wish we had time to talk about that today. Uh, Prop 10 campaign, which generated $7 billion for early childhood education. And Prop 71, which secured $3 billion for stem cell research despite the Bush administration ban. We're going to talk in greater detail about the American Foundation for Equal Rights which, as most of you know, is the sole sponsor of the Prop 8 lawsuit. So without further ado, let, let's get started, Chad. And our first, uh, Betty's here, Butch is here, your sister's here, and I'm going to start off with a question. Tell me, tell me what it was like about uh, your experiences of growing up gay in a small town in, in Arkansas and how you came out to, to Betty and, and your family and what that was like. How about now? All right. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you so much, and thanks to Skip um, as well for having me here uh, at this amazing school. I was telling Skip, when I walked in the door, I realized I've been to the library next door, but the last time I was at this building, I was eating spaghetti. <laughs> so I didn't know if most people would remember this was a spaghetti warehouse, um, but it looks a bit different now. Um, a lot happens in here other than making spaghetti these days, and it's a real privilege um, and honor uh, to be able to be here with you all uh, and to see you all uh, come out for me to meet you and for many of you for me to see you again. Um, there are a lot of, a lot of longtime friends and people that I haven't seen in a long time, um, so I'm, I'm incredibly grateful. Um, Kathy mentioned uh, Betty, Butch, and Angie, and for those of you who don't know, that's my mother, my stepfather, and my sister who are over here um, who um, really give me the, the strength and the, the grounding to do uh, what I do. And I'll tell you some time ago, I guess almost a decade ago now, um, I came home to surprise my mother at her retirement ceremony as a principal, but I also had another surprise for her. <laughs> and um, I came home and I'd already um, told my sister you know, who I was um, and that I'm a gay man. Um, and I came home and I was only home for one night. Um, and my stepfather was away um, and I walked back to my mother's room and I sat down on their bed, um, not something I regularly do. And my mom looked at me and she said, is everything okay? And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to I want to tell you something. There's something that we've never talked about that, you know, I think has created a little bit of distance, and I want to be honest with you um, and tell you that I'm gay. Um, and my mom looked at me, and she said, I knew that. <laughs> and then there was a brief pause where I could hear the hardwood floors creaking outside the room. It was my sister kneeling down listening to everything that was happening inside the room. And after that brief pause, my mother looked at me and said, did you think I would love you any less? And if, <laughs> and if every parent and if every adult that comes into contact with young people 
whether you're a legislator, a community leader, a parent, a grandparent, a brother, a sister, a teacher, to be able to be so accepting and to be able to accept our brothers and sisters for who they are, how they were born, should not be such a stretch. You know, it's what we were, we were all taught the golden rule as kids, right? Is there anyone in here that wasn't taught the golden rule? It doesn't matter what church you grew up in. Um, it's really as simple as that. You know, treat others as you wish to be treated. Um, it is anti-everything I learned um, as a kid, whether it's, you know, the moral lessons I learned from my family or the lessons I learned uh, in the pews of a church as a young kid in Arkadelphia. Um, we don't discriminate against a portion of the population because of how they look or who they are or how they were born. And it is time once and for all for us to be able to put an end to the discriminatory laws that are on the books that tell these young people that they're second-class citizens. But it's also time for us to start increasing the dialogue, something that Kathy has been a tremendous leader on. And, you know, last year Arkansas passed the anti-bullying bill, which is, sends an incredible message, aside from the legal implications and what it does with our schools and our school district, just the message it sends to our young people is so important. Um, but I just want to thank my, my family, my mom, my stepdad, and my sister uh, for being here because I couldn't do it um, without you. Thanks. You know, this morning we were at a press conference earlier. We were talking about bullying. We talked about the anti-bullying law that we passed. And we also talked about a landmark study that HRC has released today. Interesting that we had examples from Senator Elliott and others at the press conference uh, where kids did not have the same response that Betty had to you or that my family had to me. And can, could you tell us a little bit about what's in that study and specifically as it relates to Arkansas to LGBT youth? Sure. Um, as Kathy mentioned, uh, HRC just completed a study of more than 10,000 LGBT young people in all 50 states and communities across the country, um, as well as a side comparison of their straight peers um, so that we could have the comparison. Um, and then we did a state-by-state -state breakdown and that's what we released today, the Arkansas numbers. Um, and it's probably not a surprise to many of you because I know we all sort of, many of us shared the experience and the story that I just told you, some more positive, some more negative. Um, and many of you here are straight allies and people who have supported your friends and your family. Um, but what this study shows us is that the majority of young people don't have such support. Um, it says that one in four LGBT youth, this number is far worse in Arkansas, by the way. Um, it's much less so nationally. But in Arkansas, one in four, 25% of LGBT youth say that they've been physically assaulted at school. School. When I went to school, you have principals, you have teachers, you have the staff at a school. Imagine when you're out of the school. The school's where you're supposed to be protected, and that's supposed to be the safe place, just like your church should be, just like your home should be. Um, and what these results showed, and I'm gonna take it out, I have a bit of a cheat sheet here that um, breaks down the Arkansas numbers for me. And I just want to mention a couple of them specifically. Nationally, it's 53% of LGBT young people say that they're verbally harassed at school and called words like fag. In Arkansas, it's 64%. 64% of people. Do you remember what you were struggling with when you were a young person, when you were 13, 14, 15? This is what they're struggling with now. In Arkansas, 60% of our youth say they don't fit in. 68% say that they're not accepted by their state government. And I've mentioned that one in four say that they've been physically assaulted. Um, and there are real life people behind those numbers. Actual young people answered those questions. Every single one of those numbers represents a young person here in Arkansas, right now, today, in our communities, big and small. Um, there's another fascinating thing that we were able to talk a little bit about that came out of this study, is our young people are incredibly resilient. They find their support groups, they find their safe space in their peer groups. The vast majority are comfortable being who they are in front of their peer groups. You know, it's, 
thank goodness you know, it's always said that young people are our future in this case they really are regardless of their religious affiliation their partisan affiliation they can't fathom that we adults can't get ourselves together and move past this issue they can't even fathom it um, and and if, if we adults could follow the lead of our youth um, which I think we are we are really finally doing both in this state and around the country uh, we're gonna get there much more quickly um, but more than 80% said that they're optimistic about their future. Although, here in Arkansas, 64% of them said that they will have to move to another city, town, or region of the country to be able to be accepted. Now compare that with their straight peers. Their straight peers, when asked, what do you worry about? What are your stresses? What do you need support and help for? The answers were things like, my exam, my paper in English class, graduating from high school, getting into college. For LGBT people, they have many concerns that push all of those concerns way down. And it's something that we as adults shouldn't accept, and it's something um, that I will put a tremendous amount of energy and effort and be able to work with people like Kathy uh, in order to change uh, those numbers and those statistics. Um, I should also mention how grateful I am to be in my home state. This is my first day on the job, by the way, so if I mess up, I hope you'll... <laughs> I hope you'll give me a little, I've been on the job, I don't know when one clocks in, at the, I've been on the job at least for four hours, um, so, um, so it's a, a real special, thank you, um, it's a real special privilege and honor to be here in, in my home state, so. So far I think we're off to a pretty successful start, and we'll give you right. two thumbs up. Um, the, the results, the numbers that you give for Arkansas are pretty uh, depressing, but fortunately those hopeful numbers are there as well. And it would be inappropriate for me not to recognize three of the leaders of the legislature who helped get that bill passed, Senator David Johnson, the lead sponsor, uh, Representative Greg Letting, and Senator Joyce Elliott. Who Please stand up and give these three a hand. Stand up. point out that that bill was passed with uh, overwhelmingly, unanimously in the Senate, overwhelmingly in the House with tremendous bipartisan support. And I think that's important for all of us to remember uh, the bipartisan support. And we are now one of 11 states with an anti-bullying bill that includes sexual orientation and gender identity. So, uh, Okay, here's, here's a question I've been wondering about for a long time. And a lot of us watched what happened in Florida after the election in 2004. And we saw uh, Theodore Olson and David Boyce go down there and we ended up with uh, George Bush being elected president, and, or 2000. And you somehow got Olson and Boyce together to work on, against Prop 8. Uh, to challenge Prop 8. How did you do that? Yeah, I would say that um, that election night that was historic for those of us who are Democrats and that you know, President Barack Obama was elected um, President of the United States. At the same time, for those of you who care about the issues we're talking about, it was an incredibly depressing night. And I say, quite frankly, it was a night that changed, um, you know, certainly my life uh, and my professional trajectory. Um, I never expected to be here, and I never expected to have this job. Um, and I didn't think I'd be moving back to Washington, D.C. But it was that election night that really started all of that, because um, yes, President Obama was elected, um, but as I was in a hotel room in San Francisco, a ballroom, waiting on the election results, because we had Proposition 8 in California, that was a hateful, bigoted measure um, put on the ballot to revoke marriage equality. It had already been granted in California. At the same time, my home state of Arkansas passed a ban on adoption. Can you imagine that? Thank goodness your courts and your judges were so wise um, and acted and removed that discriminatory law from the books. Um, I think a real um, lesson and something noticed by other courts across the country when that was done. Um, and in Florida, another discriminatory measure. All three passed on the same night. 
So, like many, I was you know, very depressed the next day, and um, as we started to look at what might be next, the idea of a federal lawsuit. There had been state lawsuits, but no one had ever challenged these discriminatory laws um, with our federal constitution. The constitution that grants all Americans, regardless of color, creed, religious affiliation, or sexual orientation, um, the way I interpret that constitution, um, so why wouldn't we use our federal constitution? It says equal protection under the law. It's pretty simple to understand. I didn't go to law school. And so as we began to explore that, the idea um, came up. Someone suggested that Ted Olson um, might be on our side of this issue, and um, I didn't believe it. In fact, I was quite convinced I didn't have anything in common with Ted Olson. Um, and I probably still don't, except for this issue. Um, Ted Olson, for those of you who don't know, represented Bush and Bush v. Gore. Um, David Boies represented uh, Gore in Bush v. Gore before the United States Supreme Court. Um, George Bush went on, or, I'm sorry, Ted Olson went on to be, become George Bush's Solicitor General. Um, long story short, um, Ted Olson, after I met him, I found out that he was a longtime supporter of marriage equality. And not in spite of being a conservative, but quite frankly, because he's a conservative. And David Boies, who, who it didn't surprise me, but the pairing of those two, I knew would allow us to do something that we've never been able to do on the issue of marriage equality. Every time that issue has been discussed, it's always through a partisan veil. What do Democrats think? What do religious leaders think? What do Republicans think? What are members of Congress going to do, including those from, from our own state here in Arkansas and elsewhere? Um, but at the end of the day, this is a human issue that impacts real life people. And by being able to pair those two people from opposite ends of the political spectrum, it allowed us to lift the partisan veil from which we've always talked about marriage equality and shine the spotlight on the human face. The two sets of plaintiffs in our case, a lesbian couple from Northern California and a gay couple from Southern California, are the most amazing representatives who've put so much on the line and been willing to share their stories with the world in order to challenge California's Prop 8 federally. Uh, which ultimately could have ripple effects, obviously, um, in other states uh, across the country. And we've now won three times. Uh, we won at federal district court. We won at the United States Court of Appeals. We won a second appeal attempt um, that our opponents tried there. And we are now on our way. Our opponents have announced they're going to appeal our victory to the United States Supreme Court. And I expect very soon um, that we will have a victory uh, if the Supreme Court takes the case. I hope and expect we'll have a victory there. Um, did I answer all your questions? Was, I'm long-winded, <laughs> can you tell? Thank you, and I've had that question for a long time. Uh, kind of to, a follow-up question. Um, when you talked about the partisan uh, shift that there has been on this issue, um, in, in New York, for example, this year, when marriage equality passed, it was with the support of a Republican-controlled Senate and several Republican senators who helped get that through. Uh, in your new job that you've been on for four hours, um, how do you think uh, HRC moving forward will help engage more uh, Republicans on this issue? Uh, what, what do you see happening in that area? It, it's not something we, we should do. It's something we must do. Um, because the only way we're going to get things done, whether it's at the local level with city council, uh, councils or at the state level in state legislatures or in, in Congress, um, where it's hard to get a lot done sometimes these days, um, but we have made some progress, and it's been because of bipartisan support. The bill that Kathy referenced in New York, we wouldn't have marriage equality in New York without Republicans and Democrats. Um, and, and I really think that we've reached a turning point in this country um, where you can no longer run for office and benefit by attacking a group of people because of who they are. Um, we've reached a point where you need to be on the side of equality if you want to do the right thing and if you want to advance your political career. And it's my opinion that we need to support um, our elected officials who stand up for equality, whether they're Republicans or Democrats or independents. Uh, we need to stand up for them, and that's how I've handled uh, the Prop 8 court case, and that's how I intend uh, to act. Now, we also shouldn't be afraid to acknowledge there are people and there are legislators at the local and the federal level who are against us, and we should work to defeat them because there should be consequences when you're standing up 
and, and you're, you're voicing bigotry and hatred uh, with your words um, and then with your votes. Um, so we, we need to work to change these laws and we need to work to change the partisan climate and I think a ton of progress has been made. Um, there are 13 polls now that show a majority of Americans supporting um, marriage equality. So we're now in the majority um, and it shows the numbers moving very quickly um, with, with both religious groups as well as with um, ethnic minorities um, as well as with Republicans. And then once again, I'll go to the young people. It does not matter what their religious affiliation is, what region of the country they live in, or what political affiliation they have. They don't understand what the heck this is all about. Um, and again, the, the, the power of those young people who are now standing up and making their voices heard. Um, and to the extent we can all amplify those voices, that's how we're gonna win. Thank you, thank you, that's great. Um, what do you see as the role of HRC in working on uh, state and local issues. Uh, you know, y'all were very active in the campaign in, in New York, the successful campaign, active in the less successful camp campaign in North Carolina, but sort of your overall vision for HRC and then more specifically how HRC can have an impact on, on state and local issues. Sure. Well, first of all, we have to fight this battle with a sense of urgency. Sorry to keep going back to the young people, but if you say in five years, in 10 years, in 20 years, we're gonna get this done. Well, what about the 13-year-old? What about the 10-year-old? We're just gonna tell them they don't get to have a solid, stable life. They don't get to have the same hopes and dreams and aspirations as everyone else. Time actually matters. When we launched the Prop 8 case, um, we launched an effort with a number of groups um, asking people why they can't wait because there was a lot of delay in our case. It went to the California Supreme Court who took far too long to answer a, a very simple question. And a lot of groups launched this campaign on why we can't wait and there were some moving stories but one came from a couple in their 70s, Darrance and Ed who lived in Palm Springs, California. And they wrote about why they want to get married now. Not when our elected officials are ready in five years or 10 years or however long, but now. Because they're in love and because one of them has Alzheimer's and they want to get married while they can both still remember the occasion. And at our last hearing before the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, the eve before, one of them passed away. And so they never got to realize that dream. And so the impact goes on both ends of the life spectrum. And that happens at the local level, at the state level, and at the federal level. And to win a battle like this, that the consequences are so great, you have to fight a battle on all fronts. And so we have to fight the battles um, at the local level, at the state level, and at the federal level. And all have to be important and all have to be, it's, it's hard to say everything has to be a priority, but we, we, we really do have to, to focus. And oftentimes, as you all know, it's where our elected officials are and it's where they listen um, at the local level. Um, that's often what moves those people once they get to that town that can sometimes be a bit um, isolated. It's, it's you all, it's the people on the ground, it's the real life people who move them. Um, and so it'll continue to be a priority for me to, to work on, on all three fronts. And just one more note, this November, um, it's, it's incredibly important for me personally and professionally that we reelect on this issue. I am partisan, Barack Obama, because of what he has done um, for LGBT equality and because of the views that his opponent has on this issue. So that is no question of priority in terms of our success. But we also have four measures on the ballot in Maine and in Maryland. Um, in, sorry, in, in Maine we have a proactive measure. And in Maryland and in Washington, we have efforts to roll back our victories in the state legislature. And in Minnesota, we have a hateful, bigoted measure to write discrimination into the Constitution there. And we need to win all four of those. Thank you for that update on those, on those four measures. Um, the same day or the same week that President Obama came out in support of marriage equality, we saw a number of postings on the internet from ministers. And one of those was about uh, putting gays and lesbians in a pen, you know, with a wire fence around it. And there were three or four other similar things that, uh, that we've all read about. What sort of outreach does HRC have in the faith community and how is HRC gonna combat that kind of uh, hate that's coming from certain parts of the faith community? 
Well, the, hum the Human Rights Campaign has a faith and religious program in the, on the foundation side uh, of our work, and it's something that um, I, I think is incredibly important. It's something, you know, growing up here in Arkansas, I was either at home or at school or at church, um, and Mom made sure of all of those. Um, Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night oftentimes. Um, and that's where our young people, that's where they are. That's where they live their lives. And so they need to be supported on all fronts. Um, and there are diverse communities of religious leaders all across this country who are supportive and who practice what they preach when they say that all of us are God's children, why would we pick some group of God's children because of how they were born and discriminate against them? I, I don't even know how a church or who someone calls themselves a preacher or a pastor could have those views or say those words. Um, and so that kind of outreach is important. Um, when you hear that hate and that bigotry, um, we all know there's a lot of positive work that's happening, but what we hear is the hate and bigotry. And so it's so important that we work with these communities, but also that we condemn the words when we hear them, the hateful words that come from certain pulpits, not all and perhaps not even most. But when we hear those words, whether it's in our own church, we make our views known, or when it's other religious leaders in our community in a respectful way, we make our objections known and we make them known loudly because that young person, they hear what that preacher said. And if your preacher of all people is the one telling you that you were less than, and I won't even repeat some of the hateful things, you know, it, it also unfortunately comes outside the church as it relates to some of our um, officials and elected officials. Here in Arkansas, I know some of you probably followed, there was a, a school board member here in Arkansas um, I see some of you shaking your heads, but this school board member um, said some incredibly hateful things that I won't repeat on a Facebook page. A school board member. Aren't you there to protect students in the school? And this school board member said some incredibly hateful things. And what was so gratifying from what came out of that is not only did that community, and communities all across Arkansas, but communities all across the country and in some cases the world reacted and he resigned. And that's exactly what should have happened. Um, and I think, as I say, go back to what I said, I think we've reached the turning point where you don't get away with it anymore. But we all need to hold uh, these folks accountable um, and we need to have that conversation. I think most people are fair-minded people, they are good people, they don't want to intentionally inflict harm on young people. Who wakes up saying that's what they want to do in life? But this conversation, it's something that Harvey Milk talked about so much. For those of you who have either seen the documentary or watched the movie Milk, I just came from San Francisco yesterday where I, I was hosted in, in Harvey's camera store, which is where he also ran his campaign. Um, and all of his living colleagues, his speechwriter, his campaign manager, all um, were there with me and talking about you know, Harvey's legacy and, and how that informs everything you know, that I do. He talked about you know, places like Little Rock. And he talked about us being a support network for those young people. But he talked about the importance of the dialogue. And he talked about the importance of having that dialogue and that the more and more people feel comfortable coming out and tell their coworkers and their friends and their family, people stop discriminating. Because every single one of us, everyone, has someone, whether you know it or not, in your immediate family, or in your close friend group, or professional circles that is LGB or T. And the moment you know it, and the moment that conversation begins, a lot of things change. And that is a conversation that we need to increase and we need to heighten. Okay. I'm glad to hear about the, uh, the faith-based outreach that you have. Interestingly, yesterday, my pastor uh, preached on this. We're in a Topic, uh, sermon series on if the church were Christian, which is something that, that some of your uh, people might want to read. And the topic yesterday was on uh, sexuality, and my pastor certainly gave a very positive me message, oh, and it was very to gratifying to, to be in the, uh, in the congregation yesterday to hear that. 
one thing you keep going back to is the generational change and, and the speed with which uh, public opinion is changing about not only marriage equality, but, but about a lot of the issues facing the LGBT community. How do you see HRC evolving with this rapid change? Well, we've got to speak, increasingly speak to the youth. I think HRC has done a good job of this already, and it's something that I'm going to make a, a grand priority, as I don't need to, to repeat again, I know here. Um, but for instance, the bus trip um, that, that HRC had, I know many of you were there, came through here in Little Rock and, and a number of places. Um, but I intend to spend a tremendous amount of time with these young people. Um, because our politicians and our leaders, they're either going to catch up with them or they're going to get left in the dust. And they're going to forever be remembered with a legacy of bigotry and discrimination. Forever. We all know, we have, we have our own histories. We, we've had governors of this state and governors in states across the country that forever have their place in history books because of discrimination and racial discrimination. Um, and they're either gonna catch up and be on the right side of history with these young people, they're gonna be left behind, and that is forever gonna be what they're remembered by. There was an article in the New York Times just yesterday and a lot of people probably read about the, NC, uh, the NAACP endorsing marriage equality, which was a huge step because historically uh, there has been a, a great drop off in support for marriage equality among African American voters. And I know that next week, uh, your first full week, you're gonna be having lunch with the president of NAACP, uh, Ben Jealous. And what do you think the uh, importance of this endorsement is? And maybe what are you going to talk about at lunch next week? Remember, I said this was my first day on the job. <laughs> or we can give you some of our thoughts about what we'd <laughs> like to talk about. Um, well, first of all, what the NAACP did in the public statement that they made uh, was tremendous. And that message was heard far and wide across this country. Um, and so important because we win our major civil rights victories when we work together and when we work across partisan lines and when we work across racial lines and, and all of our ethnic groups come together. If you remember those famous photos from the 60s and the civil rights movement, um, you didn't only see African Americans marching down the street, you saw them marching arm in arm with their white brothers and sisters. Um, and I could go on and on and on, it's the same with the, with the farm workers movement. Um, and we win by building coalitions and by building bridges. Um, also important to note, perhaps it's an obvious, but oftentimes people think LGBT are this monolithic group of people. Um, we're male, we're female, we're black, we're white, we're L, we're G, we're B, we're T. Um, we live in all regions in the country, tiny and small, Hope and Hot Springs and Arkadelphia and Little Rock. Um, and um, so we have to acknowledge our diverse community. Um, we have to embrace it, and we have to work together. Um, and that's why it's so important to me uh, to meet with Ben Jealous, who's uh, the president of the NAACP. We're, we're having lunch in my first days um, in, in Washington, um, and I'm, I'm looking forward to talking about ways that we can work together and, and find our common interests. You know, Julian Bond, who's one of the great civil rights leaders um, in our country, um, Julian Bond has been one of the greatest advocates for marriage equality for many, many years. And this was his personal passion that he led and he has fought for uh, and he finally uh, succeeded in getting. And, and we all owe not only the NAACP, but Julian, who's now uh, the chairman emeritus uh, of the NAACP, uh, a great deal of, of gratitude. Okay, I've had my time to ask questions of Chad, and now we're going to give you your time to ask questions. So. Um, we'll, we'll start right here on the front row because we've got a big crowd. If you would stand up and, and say your question, I'm not sure. We've got microphones that will be coming. I am so glad that you have the job that you have. Um, I'm Thank just you. thrilled. Um, my son is uh, 17 years old. He is gay. He has tried to kill himself three times. He is now in the wilderness for a Second Nature Wilderness Program. He talked to us many times before he left about how it, didn't, it wasn't a big deal, that people were kind, that it was okay. 
And then he went to the wilderness and he had to write because that was part of his assignment. And in his 10 page letter, he documented very clearly about why he wanted to kill himself and how difficult it was to grow up being a gay boy in Arkansas. Young people were the people that were hurting him. My family was the people that were hurting him. Old people hurt him too. I probably messed up someplace along the line too in terms of not protecting him enough. Benjamin is a wonderful boy. Your job is secure because there is so much work to be done. What can I as a mother who loves her son desperately but won't have him home again for probably 18, 24 months do to keep him hopeful because he had no hope. He wanted to die May 22nd, 2012. That was his plan because he couldn't go on. Now we've got a little bit of hope. Please tell me what I can tell him so that there's more hope. Well, I can tell you that I do what I do because of Benjamin. And first of all, he's so lucky to have you. And so lucky to have you supporting him and telling him that you love him and being there for him. And feel confident in what you've given him already. And know that if you can tell your story and to tell the story that you just told, I'm not gonna look around, but I bet there's not a lot of dry eyes in the room right now. But a story like that wakes up the world. And we're lucky because Benjamin's still there. But there are countless Benjamins across this country who are headed there or who are no longer with us because they weren't in supportive communities. And because we directly and intentionally, as a country, sent the message that he's a second class citizen. And as long as we have people like Benjamin, we are all responsible every single day when we hear stories like this and when we hear of the tragic consequences that happen all over this country. And it doesn't matter where you live, in towns big and small. It's happened all over California, and it's happened, I know, in Arkansas, and in every state. Sometimes we know why it was, because people will acknowledge it and talk about it, and oftentimes we never know. But thank you for being willing to tell your story, and for us to be able to elevate stories like yours, and to increase support programs for people like Benjamin, so that no one else has to go through those most vulnerable years without that support network, whether it's in their schools or in their homes or in their churches. But let Benjamin inspire the rest of us to make sure that there's no one else where he was. Um, and I, I, I'm so grateful for you telling this story. I can assure you on my first day in the office, I promise I'm not gonna forget about Benjamin. Thank you. You deserve a round of applause for telling me. Thank you. I'm so proud of you because you're from Arkadelphia. And I'm an Arkadelphia native, but I came to Little Rock in 1946, and that was my new home, and so Little Rock owns me, they think. The thing that I wanted to share with you and your being here on your first day is that I am known as one of the straights. I am straight, but I've been known as an ally for equality, regardless to how people try to discriminate all the many categories they discriminate in. And I just wanted to share this story. I remember in Arkadelphia as a little girl, the first person, they didn't call them what they call them now, they just said they were funny. One of the most humanitarian, most philanthropic, most caring person, that I ever knew and I cherish that we didn't discriminate on him and yet it was a 
public secret and everybody knew, but they knew who he truly was, a friend of education, a friend of children. And then when I came to Little Rock, I lived in the home with a relative. And that relative, little boy, was one of the ones that I knew was one of the most talented people that has ever been born. He grew to become the city editor of the Washington Post. And that particular person that I was always his special friend that we always knew that you would never discriminate against a talented person that God had given us. But the most important thing of how cruel we can be as Judo Christians, and I am one of them Baptist born, Baptist bred, and when I'm gone, I'll be a Baptist gone. <laughs> the thing is that when, when he died, as a person who was a bureau chief in Ontario, and I helped prepare the funeral, and the delegation from Washington Post came, that the first thing that hurt me the most was in my church, one of the oldest churches, one of the most respected educators, didn't want us to have the funeral of this gay man in our church because he probably had HIV and he will all have it when the funeral is over. That's how ignorant sometimes even those who have diplomas called educated certificates can be. So I just felt that I wanted you to just respond to how important is it for straight people like me, old fashioned straight, <laughs> to be allies for equality in every aspect of human life. Well, I think we should just leave and put these two up here. <laughs> and my job's done. I can just go back to California. I don't even need to go to Washington. <laughs> Straight allies, as you um, so eloquently just articulated and showed this room why, Straight allies are so important for us winning this battle. We don't win it alone. We don't win it alone. And for people like you to be willing to stand up and to be there both personally and privately with someone that you loved and cared about, but also to be there publicly and to talk in the way that you're talking right now and talking here. And um, I'm just going to, we've never met before, but I'm going to guess she wasn't very shy about making her views known when that church um, blocked them or tried to block them from doing what they did. As you said, they had the funeral there. <laughs> so there is no question uh, this work uh, is, is important in, in the, the diverse ways that I mentioned before that we all stand together. Um, but for our straight friends and straight family, um, and allies to stand up. It amplifies our voices. We multiply. There are more of you than there are us, first of all. And so in, in terms of, uh, maybe not, I don't know, someone laughed like I was wrong, who knows? <laughs> um, but, but thank you for saying what you said and what you've done and, and let's find some ways to work together. I'll tell you as we go to the next question that Miss Annie is, is not shy. As you, as you noticed. We have a question all the way in the back. I, I, on a personal note, before I ask my question, because it's unrelated, I just want to say, as a gay man who grew up here in Arkansas in a conservative religious family, uh, thank you for making people who grew up like me, such a huge focus for the human rights campaign. Um, I want you to rest assured that this, as a strategic decision to make uh, the organization a vital voice and uh, institution of support for some of our most vulnerable people in our society, this is the right decision. Rest assured in that. Thank you. Uh, my question is political. Uh, you, you said earlier that it's important to make uh, both Republicans and Democrats, you know, to provide support for both Republican and Democratic politicians who uh, support marriage equality and support uh, LGBT rights. Uh, how, do you, how do you reconcile that 
with the knowledge that politically uh, offering, offering support to some Republicans um, enables uh, a majority of a, to come about in a party that overwhelmingly doesn't support that and especially like in the halls of Congress wouldn't support, uh, wouldn't support you know, legislation that advances the rights of LGBT people. It's, it's a great question um, and a, a dilemma that many have talked about uh, and have debated. Um, my theory is, first of all, everyone needs to make, obviously, your own personal decisions as it relates to who you support and who you contribute to, because I know that people have issues that are priorities important to them on, on, on a number of, of fronts that don't just relate to this. Um, but this issue, for me, um, is so life-impacting on young people um, that it at least has to become a top priority. It's certainly number one for me. And my view is, when there are Republicans, we don't have enough of them, but when there are Republicans that'll stand up for equality and stand up on these issues, as some did in New York, and as Kathy just said, some did in Arkansas as it relates to the anti-bullying bill, I want to support people because they did that, but I also want to support those people because they have the seat at the table that most of us don't have. And if anyone's gonna start changing those minds, and having that voice when those closed door meetings happen that most of us don't know about and aren't told about and aren't in the room for. We need people in that room making the case too. Um, and, and I know it's not easy, and I know we all have our, our, our partisan views. I am, I am a partisan Democrat. I, I might say, although I think I had a few Republican friends before this, but most of the Republican friends I have today are because of marriage equality. Um, I never thought I would even know Ted Olson, much less call him uh, a friend. And, you know, Ted and I agree um, on this one issue, and I'm pretty confident that there's not even one other uh, that we do agree on. <laughs> I know that we don't agree when we vote for president, that's for sure. Um, but we have him on this, um, and I'm very grateful, and, and what he has contributed um, you know, to our movement is tremendous. And I think Ted is, is a grand example of the importance of reaching across that partisan aisles. Um, but you have to make the decision case by case, um, and, um, and it's, it's an important question. Thank you. Hi. Um, my question has to do with the litigation surrounding uh, same-sex marriage. Uh, just recently, the First Circuit Court of Appeals in Boston ruled against DOMA, and uh, the Prop 8 case will most likely be headed towards the Supreme Court. Um, my question is, does the human rights campaign support a federal right to same-sex marriage, or would they, which would be, I guess, Prop 8's avenue if the Supreme Court ruled in favor of uh, California? Or do you support uh, the Tenth Amendment state rights issue where, um, if that case goes to the Supreme Court, the court won't recognize a federal right to same-sex marriage, but say really that it's up to the states because marriage has always been left to the states. Yeah. Good question. Are you in law school? No, I'm not. But I'm, a, <laughs> I'm a grad student in political <laughs> science. So. It's, a, it's, it's a great question, um, and I think there's an easy answer to that. Should those of you who live here in Arkansas wait until the day a ballot measure will pass to give you marriage equality? While you have it, in other states, perhaps we'll have it in California, perhaps we'll have it in New York. If you make enough money, maybe you can move to one of those places and have equal rights. That's not what we do in this country. One's state borders should not determine one's rights. When it comes to our American rights, our civil rights that are given to us by the Bill of Rights and the United States Constitution, it's for all Americans. It doesn't say it's for an American if you live in Massachusetts, or an American if you live in Vermont, or an American if you live in Arkansas, sorry. That's not how we should determine these things, having said that. In order to get there and to get where we need to go, we need to make progress at the state level. We need to win these state battles, and we need to take the opportunities we have. Increasingly, state legislatures are moving these issues forward and we're winning. Um, I think we're gonna start winning ballot measure campaigns across the country, and those are all important, and they have to be priorities for progress. Um, but at the end of the day, our Constitution's there to protect every single one of us. 
Um, and I do think, you know, both of those cases, um, what he was mentioning there, there's the Prop 8 case, um, which, as you, as you might know, we won on a, a major victory across the board. Um, Chief Judge Walker, um, a Republican-appointed judge, uh, ruled that Proposition 8 was a violation of the United States Constitution and a violation of the Equal Protection and Due Process Clause of the United States Constitution. Um, and it reads like a novel, and I would encourage all of you to read it if you haven't. Um, when that went up on appeal, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, a three-judge panel, narrowed th that opinion. And although they didn't disagree with all those things, they said we don't have to go that far because based on um, other Supreme Court rulings, you can't grant a right and then take that right away, which is what happened in California. But once this issue at the Supreme Court chooses uh, to take uh, the Perry case, um, the Supreme Court um, has the full case before them. They can choose to go where the Ninth Circuit went, they can choose to go, um, and there are nine people who will play a major role in all of our futures. As it relates to the DOMA case, there have now been a number of courts that have, have deemed DOMA unconstitutional. Again, Republican and Democratic appointed federal judges um, have called DOMA unconstitutional. And we are virtually at the same time likely to uh, hit the Supreme Court, and it'll be up. It takes four votes to take a case, and obviously it takes five to win. Um, and um, I hope and expect whichever or both cases they take uh, will win them. We have time for one last question. I think we've got uh, somebody up here at the front. Thanks, Bob. Okay, I'm one of the young ones that you keep talking about. I'm 19 years old. I am a daughter of a Pentecostal preacher, a daughter of a farmer, and a daughter of a very, very red, yellow, uh, like, no, a, uh, I'm sorry, a daughter of a very red, elephant-riding Republican. Um, all, from all the stuff that is said, they don't know I'm here, you know, they don't know that I'm a part of the Young Democrats or a part of CAR or DIS, um, I've, or the self-evident truth that HRC done a couple months ago. I want to do more. Like, I'm tired of the li I know I have to live this double life, but I want to do more for this cause because I'm underneath the LGBT community. I'm part of the stuff that you talked about with the statistics, and I want to rise above that. Um, all those things that you just said inspired me to do more, but I want to have my foot more into the door. Can you please tell me more? Kick that door down. Wow. <laughs> What's your name again? Well, first, on behalf of, I guess, the community that you don't feel comfortable you know, being who you are, you know, I, I want to tell you that I'm, I'm sorry because they should be there for you and there may be some, some surprises in there when you do and decide that you're ready. Um, and I know you'll do it on your own time, just like I and just like others did. Um, and I venture to guess that you have a, a great support network around you, whether it's your, your friend group or, or the community groups that you're members of and that they're your rocks um, as, you, as you go through this. Um, the, the hope I'll also offer, you know, we, we never know where family members or where colleagues or friends are gonna land on this issue. Um, when we're initially honest with them. And I know it's something that you probably fret and fear and lose sleep over every day and every night. Um, but over time, those who love you keep loving you. And none of us can say, or you probably already would have made the decision to come out to them how they're gonna react, but have your support group and do it on your own time. And you know the, the energy and fire that you just showed um, again, um, we need to put it to work. Um, and you said get your foot in the door and I said kick the door down. Um, and um, you know, you represent a generation that really will kick the door down and someday you'll be the one sitting up here. Um, and um, I, I hope that, that you'll stay in touch and continue to work uh, with HRC and I can promise you, um, and I can really promise this, because if I don't, um, I promise my mom will come after me. I will be back here a lot. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm often in Arkansas, I'm here for holidays, and 
um, I'd love to find uh, ways to stay in touch and make sure you're in touch with the team at HRC um, and, and can work with you because it's, it's people like you that are going to win what is the civil rights battle of your generation. It's the civil rights battle for all of us, but it's your generation that's going to be the ones that kick that wall of discrimination down once and for all. Just like you read in the history books in school about the civil rights leaders and those who you know, eradicated racial discrimination and who were, were leading in the March on Selma and, and the Little Rock Nine, you know, they're, they're, they're great stories right here in our own backyard uh, in, in Little Rock. Um, and, and you and your friends and your peers are gonna be those great stories. Um, and you know, someday your kids are gonna read about those. So I'm sorry that you're having to go through what you go through, but I can tell that you're also using it and channeling um, that frustration and that feeling um, to some pretty phenomenal energy um, and motivation. So thank you uh, for being willing to share with those of us in this room. Um, and I, I wish you the best of luck and, and look forward to being able to work with you. Thank you. We want to thank the Clinton School. We want to thank HRC. Uh, we want to thank you for choosing to spend your first day with us. You have inspired us, and we're going to be following you closely, like all of us as, as proud Arkansans. And thank you to everybody who came and participated. And we've got a lot of kicking to go start doing. So thank you. Thank you all. Let's get to work.